Privilege to turn the service over to the hands of our pastor. Give her a great big amen as she comes. Amen. Yes, we got a right to praise him for everything. He continues to bless us again and again. What can you say? What can you say? When everything's going good, it's a happy time. When everything's going bad, it's still a happy time. Thank God for the victory. That's what I do. No matter what is bad or whatever. God is good. Thanks, honey. Yes. This message has been on the shelf since January. I told, I told you I got about five more left. January, that's the first of the year. And I thought, wow. Yes, we're so happy for all of you that are here. Special welcome to all of our visitors. We're glad that you came. God is so good, so good, so good. This message, I thought to myself, how many people do their best to avoid any type of trial or persecution? You know what? If you're trying to avoid that, you're not going to heaven. 
because you can't even get there unless you go through all this, all the things that you got to go through. So when I look, when I read this scripture, and it says, I'm coming to you from Acts the 16th chapter. It says, uh, it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of div divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. And the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out. You would think, well, uh, she said, These men are the, uh, men of the Most High God. Uh, but it was a spirit that was doing, just following you around. You know, find people saying the same thing over and over again. It's the people, these are men of uh, uh, the most high God. These men the most high God. You start thinking you're nuts. So Paul, Paul recognized this was a spirit. It really wasn't one what it was supposed to be. Listen to this. He said, when our masters saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. How many people are trying not to say anything or do anything because you're going to cause some trouble? You cannot be saved and speak truth and not cause trouble. It's impossible. And he said, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates, they rent off their clothes and commanded to, and, and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust him into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stock. This is where I want you to listen to. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. They brought about an earthquake. Because they were worshiping God in the midst of being in prison. You know, when you, when you look at people today, you think to, you think to yourself, okay, uh, when you're going through something that, no, m most people in prison don't want to sing. They don't want to praise God. They don't want to shout. And I thought, we are, we are people that need to get accustomed to shouting and praising God when things are not going the way you want it to. Yes. So we try to avoid any suffering if we can, any persecution. You can't even get to the kingdom without it. It's all about our making. It's about what God is making us to be. We can't get away from that. So it says, if I can avoid suffering and persecution, I'm going to do everything I can not to make any waves or rock any boats for anybody. You cannot do that and, do, and be successful in telling people about God. This says, it says here, so... If I, if I stand back and say, I'll just let somebody else say it. No, you got to say it. I didn't tell my mom, you got to tell her. I didn't tell my brother, my sister, you got to tell them. So don't just stand up there and say, well, I didn't say nothing because I didn't want to upset nobody. You're going to upset some people. No matter how you try. You know what? You cannot preach this gospel and preach it straight and not hurt some people. You're going to make some people mad, some people frustrated, some people upset with you or whatever. I looked in the audience this morning, I saw this man and woman that came last Sunday, and he looked at me the whole time I was preaching like, what are you talking about? But I looked back this morning, I thought, well, he's mad. Because his look on his face was like, you know, that's what's wrong with you women. That was a look that was on his face. And so when I looked at this morning, he was back, I thought the man actually came back. I meant to address him and said, hey, uh, uh, maybe I ain't so bad after all, am I? Okay. So what God's got to do with us, he's going to put us through a refinery. The refinery hurts. That you got to be set on fire to be refined. And we're trying to get away from that. Okay, so uh, if, if I can get away from the fire and the flood, my life would be so much happier. No, it wouldn't be. Because you, uh, 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 do you know if you have that, you got to compromise. You got to compromise because the only way I escape it, I have to take a back seat. I have to say I don't have nothing to say. I hate to see people that see something wrong going on and won't say nothing about it. Say something. Say that's not right. Well, I didn't say that. It's not my business. It is your business. If you see somebody being treated wrong or treated bad, it is your business. You should say something. So 
We get accustomed. You can tell who's got the victory, who had a good week, and who had a bad one. Because when they come to church, they, uh, you know, just kind of whatever. You got to push them and prime them to praise God. Come on. But when you know him, I thought this week when I was in my room in prayer and, and I was dealing with, with Juana's being gone and, and, uh, and being her birthday and my mind going back over that. And you know what I did? I looked up and did what Job said. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And I said, God, you don't make mistakes. We may feel the pain of it. We may feel whatever we're supposed to feel, but you don't make mistakes. Whatever you did for me, you did a good thing, even though it doesn't feel good. We got to learn to praise God when it doesn't feel good. I'm still going to worship God. I'm still going to praise him no matter what. If you come into the church and just make up your mind, I don't care how bad the week's been, I'm getting ready to praise God. I don't care how I feel, I'm getting ready to praise God. I'm getting ready to worship him. Yes. You got to just say, I got to praise him. All that I've been through, I still got joy. You got to let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Without that joy, you can't be strong. You can't have a good time. You're always down. You're depressed. You can either live in the valley of depression or you can come out and shout on the mountaintop. No matter, that's up to you. That's up to you. See, when I look at this, Paul said, and they said, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. You think about them praising God caused God to move in an earthquake. I'm going to shake this thing. How many things in your life could be shaken if you just get accustomed to praising God instead of complaining about it? Yes. Start some earthquakes, honey. Start some earthquakes. So I'm going to shout until the, he shakes the earth. The doors of the prison flew open. Because they were singing and praising God at midnight. Most of y'all sleep at that time. I find that some of the things that God get done for us happens late at night or early morning. I love it. If I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm not going to say, oh, my God. Is it? <laughs> oh, no. Get up. Start thanking him. Thank you for everything. Do you know there's not a day pass in your life that there ain't something to thank God for? Every day of your life is something. I don't care what's going on. Some good is somewhere. Because the goodness of God fills the earth. His goodness is everywhere. So if his goodness is everywhere, how can I not praise him? I got to praise him. It's, it's nothing like it. Now, the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep because what's going on here? It started with praise. It started with worship. So now they say, what's going on here? And uh, it woke, up the, it woke up, the, uh, up the keeper of the prison, and he's seeing the prison doors open. He drew out his sword like, what's going on here? So he pulled his sword out like, uh, I don't know, if somebody broke in or what's going on? No, listen to this. And he said, and would have killed himself. Supposing that the prisoners, they slipped out of here. They're going to do me a job. I'm laying up here asleep. The prisoners are escaping. I might as well kill myself. You never want to end your life because situations are bad. No, you know, ain't that much trouble in the world. Have you said, you know, I just want to take my life. I ain't never had it that bad. And as much as you go through things in this life, it's not so bad until I just, uh, I'd be better off dead. No, I'm better off praising God. I'm better off worshiping God, going through what I got to go through. And Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, do thyself no harm. Don't, hey, don't kill yourself. We're all here. You know what most of y'all would do? The doors is open. Let's get out of here before they lock back. See, but Paul still was in there praising God and having church, wasn't concerned about anything, and, and wasn't in a hurry to get out. You know why? Because God's in the prison. He's in the prison. He got me shouting. He got me worshiping him. I don't need to run. Where are you going, baby? God is here. We're having church. His presence is here. Yes. So he said, he brought them out. He fell down. He brought a light. Sprang in, came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas and said, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How did he know this was about salvation? Because this is not normal behavior. How does he know this is about salvation? He don't know God. 
But he says, what must I do to be saved? I asked the lady this morning in the prayer line, I said, I said, uh, have you ever been saved? She said, I said, you don't know what saved is, do you? She said, no. I said, so that's accepting the Lord into your heart, asking him to forgive you of your sin. So that's what salvation is. She said, yeah. I said, but God will give it to you if you want it. You got to want it. But I think if we don't get accustomed to the fact that from the time you get saved, you're going to begin to suffer. You're going to begin to go through some things. Things ain't going to be great. Ain't going to be good. Maybe you're getting ready to go through some things. And if you think, people say, well, you get saved, all your troubles is over. No, it's not. No, it's not. But God is there to help you through your trouble. But we don't give him a chance because we're shutting doors left and right. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything. You're on the job, see somebody being done wrong and know they're doing them wrong and they're about to lose their job and, and you, uh, well, I didn't say anything. I didn't want to lose my job. We're so busy concerned about us and our own welfare, we don't have time to think about the other person. Maybe if I speak up, maybe if I say something. See, I told Michelle, where's Michelle? Yeah, when she went back to that job and said, if he leaves, I'll leave. As bad as he wanted him out of there, he couldn't do nothing with it. When you present truth to a person, they can't do nothing with it. Because you can't do nothing against the truth, only for it. You can't do nothing against it. So if, I, if I'm speaking truth, wait a minute. I'm not getting ready to give it up. I'm going to say, when I see something wrong, you've seen that show on TV that's called What Would You Do? And a lot of times people sit there, somebody's being mistreated, ain't treated right, and they say, so what would you do? And people, all people, everybody has different responses. Somebody think it's wrong, shouldn't do that. Leave that man alone. Leave that person alone. They feel it, so, so they get involved. And pretty soon, uh, uh, Keonis come out and say, uh, we're here for, for this. Why did, you, why did you have something to say? It was wrong. Do we understand when it's wrong, it's time to talk? When it's wrong, it's time to speak up? When we see people being treated bad, should not we say something? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I don't keep my mouth shut. He said, oh, no, you don't. You got to do what God called you to do. And that's taking a stand, doing what you know is right. You got to do it. So Paul and them now is going through a situation. They, they want to beat him up, put throwing him in the prison. They didn't say, God, what did I do? No, I'm doing something right. When everything bad is happening to you, stop for a minute and say, I'm doing something right. When people talk about me and lie on me, I'm doing something right. I'm doing something that God wants me to do. That's why they're doing that. That's where you got to go. So as I look at that, I'm thinking, if something happened to you today that you don't consider good, it's bad, how would you deal with it? How would you deal with it? Are you going to be so sad for the rest of the week because Monday was a bad day? I'm not letting Monday determine whether or not I have a good week or not. He goes, it started, it started off bad. You know, when it starts off bad, it's going to end bad. For you, it might. Not for me. Because I determine whether I have joy. I determine whether I got peace of mind. I determine whether I'm going to go forward or let you pull me down and make me feel depressed and can't get out of it. I don't want to feel depressed. I don't want to feel down. you got to determine that. Yes. He said, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's not, understand, it's a small thing. For the earnest expectation of, our, of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. So I'm waiting for God to manifest himself. In the midst of the storm, where is he? When things are going bad, you know what? I am convinced you will get more from God if you will praise him than you will complain it. Anybody can complain. It don't take any strength or courage to complain. Just complain about everything. Everything's bad. This is bad. That's bad. When it rains, it pours. But why is it always pouring on you? Why can't you say, I'm going to have a good time? I'm going to make the best out of it. You know, the average black person, when they get in trouble and get too much press, they're going to get them some chicken. <laughs> they head down somewhere for some chicken. 
Because in the midst of no matter what happened to them, they figured, get something to eat. We ought to get something to eat. Make a cake. And then when they get their chicken, no matter, they, they, they laugh while they talk about y'all. You know what? That's crazy, man. Ain't it? This chicken is good. And they go on about their business. Where, where you got other people worried, worried about it? I can't eat. The average black man has never been, not been able to eat because he had problems. That's not happening. The, the first thing they say, I'm hungry. You want to go get something to eat? In the midst of all the trouble that's going on, you want to go get something to eat? Because we, we somehow found ourselves in a place that we could be happy if we had something to eat. And, and it ain't even in the food. It's in God. So you find yourself, I got to have this because I feel better. If I just get me something good, make me some ice cream or give me a piece of cake, I'll feel better. No, you won't because the minute you swallow it and finish it, you ain't happy. You're not happy. So how can I, how can I make my life better? better you can make it better by starting out this week whatever's coming i'm gonna shout it out anyway i'm gonna praise god anyway i'm gonna worship him anyway see the scripture says that yea thou heardest not yea thou knowest not yea from the time that thine ear was not open for i knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously and was called a transgressors from the womb for my name's sake will i defer my anger and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Cliff said that one time, so the Lord said, I'm going to teach you a lesson in the furnace of affliction. I said, you know what that is? Baby, ask me. The furnace of affliction, you getting ready to burn, boy. You getting ready to feel some fire. And that, that furnace of affliction, that's nothing to play with. I've been there, let me tell you. But if you stay in the fire, you're going to come out better. You learn how to shout in the fire. Most people can't do that. you got to mature spiritually where I can shout in the fire. Because I know without a doubt this is going to be over. At some point, it's going to be over. So uh, Demetrius told me one time when I went to see him, he said, he said Mom, the Lord told me I'm going to, um, what was that word? I'm going to pulverize you. I said, you know what that means? Look it up. You turn into mush. There's nothing left of you. And that's the only way we're going to be able to function in the kingdom when there's nothing left of us. We can't, we can't be effective. We can't really win until you understand that God's going to destroy you and your will till you say, yes, Lord. Yes to you. When I got saved, a lot of people know I was a fighter, and, and I, I didn't do nothing but beat up people and mean, evil. But one thing he taught me right after I got saved, you're going to have to get accustomed that you can't respond to when people are talking about you and lying on you and doing this stuff because nobody lied on me and got away with it. Nobody did that to me. I got saved, I'm thinking, what do you do? I'm going to take the fire out of it. I'm going to take the fight out of you. How does he get it out? With fire. He burns you until you cease to hollow. Till you cease. You say, well, let me out. Every time you hollow, you stay in any longer. I know I'm ready now. I'm gold. You ain't gold. No, he's going to keep you in the fire because that's the only way he can use you. We want to be used of God. We want God to bless us, but we don't want to go through the fire. You got to go through the fire, through the furnace. I told you when I was in the church in Oklahoma, I was the only black in that church, uh, uh, Pentecost Church of God of America for a while. And boy, did I get treated bad. And they had some racist people in there who called me a nigger and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, I'm getting up out of here. The Lord said, you ain't going nowhere. You got to stay here. Nobody ever called me that before I got saved. I'm not taking that. Oh, you're going to take it. And you're going to look up and say, thank you for taking me through it having a church meeting with the pastor and, and, and one old lady just didn't like me. I don't know why I do nothing to her. But you, you're not doing nothing for the devil not to like you. And so I prayed prior to going because I thought I don't know what this meeting is about. And I got my, some accusers there accusing me of a lot of things that's not true. And I need to, 
I need to, I need to speak for this. And that woman just rose up with her cane. She was walking with a cane. She was so old. She's almost 80 years old. And she raised her cane up at me and said, let me tell you something, Sister Rose. I'm going to heaven. There ain't no nigga going to keep me out of there. I said, I am not right here. I said, <clears throat> and then I said to the Lord, I ask you to keep me saved. Because otherwise I would take her cane and beat the crap out of her. I can't beat the crap out of people saved. That's what I was telling you, uh, Pookie, the other night. He said, I thought, I'll, I'll take him out. I said, oh, you can't do that? Now, he going he gonna, he gonna to put you in the fight. But when he finishes with you, you won't want to fight no more. Not like that. You're going to fight the devil. So I, now I'm going to strengthen you that you can fight the devil, but you ain't going to be fighting, cussing people out, and putting them in their place, and don't you dare. That ain't happening. He, he took it out of me. It wasn't easy. I cried a lot. I cried not because of the pain. I cried because I couldn't kick butt. That's what I was used to doing. You got me in a position here where I can't, I can't defend myself. And these people are running over me. They're calling me names, cursing me out. What do I do? You're going to take it. And I thought, God, you got to help me. I told you about Miss Hill. Miss Hill... She had got a dress from me. I, she, said, she said, Rose, if you don't want that dress, could I buy it from you? I said, sure, I'll sell it to you. She never would pay me my money. So I went by her house, and I said, uh, Miss Hill, I said, I just came by to see if you have the money for that dress. I was shut up in her house. She said, you so-and-so, so-and-so, blankety, blankety, blank. I just asked for my money. She knocked, she came over to me and she pushed me upside the wall. I bounced off the wall. I said, keep me God. <laughs> you push me upside that wall. I'm coming back. You push me back, I'm coming back. God gave me grace though. And I said like this, I said, <clears throat> don't push me again. I make you think if you push me again, I'm going to knock the crap out of you. And I was standing there, and she said, wait a minute, let me get my so-and-so gun and shoot you in your blankety blank. And I'm standing there like this. And, Miss, and Sergeant Hill, a very nice man, I don't know how he hooked up with that crazy woman. And he said, Miss Banks, he said, I apologize for my wife. He said, just leave. She's in the back looking for the gun. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I just went on and left. I thought, okay, I'll go. I went on down the hill toward my park, toward my building. I was crying. I said, Lord, I said, uh, I want to be saved. I really want to be saved. <laughs> Help me to be saved. I cried a lot because I couldn't fight. And I told him, I said, Lord, I'm not crying about anything because I can't fight. That's why I'm crying. Because nobody treated me like this before I got saved. I would never take it. Treat me bad if you want to. You will regret it. I'm not going to regret it. You will. Couldn't do it. He takes it out of you. So if you're a fighter like Pook, Pook you in for the ride. He going to throw your tail up in that fire, in that fire and you going to come out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, get back in there. Get back in there. I'm going to teach you something. But when he gets through with you, you don't fight people no more. You fight the devil and you win. And you win. See, I'm a firm believer if you're a fighter in the world, if you get saved, you'll be a fighter for God. Because I ain't going to let nobody take advantage of me and, and put me in a bad situation. I'm not going to do it. I don't fear anybody that sit there and look at me crazy when I'm preaching because I know I'm rubbing people and, and, they, and they don't like it and they're mad about it. And I don't care about that. Because they can't, they can't really stop me from doing my job. That's why Paul, I mean, I mean, God told Ezekiel, he said, look, set your face like a rock. Don't be, don't, don't be concerned about how they look at you. I get some looks when I'm preaching sometimes from people like, I don't care. If you think that's going to stop me, I'm coming back harder. I'm not going to stop. How many of you have not been able to keep victory in your life simply from the fact you are so used to fighting everybody. But I don't want to say nothing to cause any problem. 
Sometimes people in their marriage the same way. Well, I didn't want to tell her that she was wrong. Why not? Well, I didn't want her to get upset. I don't care if you get upset. Here it is. I mean, I didn't mind telling my husband if I was the pastor. He always said, who's talking to me, the pastor or the, or the wife? Because if it's the wife, you need to shut up. <laughs> but I told him the truth. Here it is. This is what it is. No, this is the pastor talking. He said, okay, okay, what you saying? He humbled himself and listened. Because this is not just Rose, your wife. This is about right and wrong here, and we got to deal with it. We're not getting ready to just let that go. But he listened. So God's going to teach you that if you're going to walk with me and be saved, be prepared to suffer. See? Paul said, if I have to boast at all, I'm going to boast about, the, about, the, uh, about my own infirmities. If I must start... Praising God and worshiping God is going to be about my suffering. I don't praise God, but that, I mean, what do you expect me to do? We expect you to praise God. You may be crying, but praise God. See? He said, if I must needs glory, Paul said. He said, Paul saw God in everything that he did. In the joy, in pain, hope, despair, freedom, bondage. In everything. He saw God. That's why he reached a place in his life where he said, I'm not going to let nothing separate me from God. Because Paul was one that helped to, helped to destroy the church. He was a fighter. He held Stephen's clothes while they stoned him to death. He was about persecuting the church. And God, when he brings him to him, he says, Ananias, go tell Paul how great things he's going to suffer for me. He just said, tell him oh, what a great person he's going to be. Tell him how great things he's getting ready to suffer. And he went through it too. If you don't come mentally prepared for war, you won't make it. Because this is about war. It's about shouting and praising God in the midst of the war. It's about with the sword in your hand, you praising God. When the enemy comes out against you like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. No. Paul was not distracted by the bad things, the suffering. He had to contend with it, with rebels, critics, and understand this, you will always have critics. I don't care what you do, how right you do it, somebody's going to criticize you. Get to the place, I don't care. You're better off, I don't care. So what you going to do, praise God? What you going to do, shout? Shout it out. Worship him. What God is trying to do to you is fix you and make you ready for the kingdom. And that means you're going to have to suffer. That means you have to go through persecution. That means things are going to be rough. That means it ain't going to always be like this. It's going to really get some mountains and some valleys. Oh, you're going through those things. But if you go through it, think about what you're going to be like when it's, when it's done. What God has made me to be after 53 years, I love every minute of it. I don't have to not like me. You look in the mirror and say, you know, you one sorry joker. But when he fixes you and you become sweet and kind and loving, that's a, that's a good thing. You know, people say, don't go, who is that, is that Rose Liddell? Don't say nothing to her, honey, because she'll come off on you like all guys. You don't want to live your life like the person that's going to beat up everybody. No, that change. Don't get distracted. Sometimes trials and troubles come in our life to distract us. We don't let it distract you. you. You make up in your mind, I am going to win this battle. It ain't simple, but I'm going to win it. I'm going to be an overcomer. You declare. You declare that. I'm going to be an overcomer because he already overcame. He said, now you can do it. So don't, don't lose it. Don't give up because things is going bad. Your wife's acting a fool. Your husband's acting a fool. Your kids is going out getting drunk. Don't let that take away your victory. Go to bed at night and get some sleep. <laughs> Paul said, I had to deal with false teachers that was destroying people's lives with their, with their polluted messages. I think of T.D. Jakes. Polluted. You're putting that stuff out there. These people are, are going to die and go to hell because they're not getting the truth. 
You're only going to survive with truth. You can't survive no other way. You got to have truth. If you can't take truth, you can't make it to heaven. And truth is painful sometimes. Listen, I'm coming to that. So if I have infirmities, if I'm going through something like that, so what? So what? See? Oh. There's all type of, let me tell you about Michelangelo. I'm sure everybody's heard of him. He was a sculptor. You know what he would do? I studied about him. He would look at the marble piece and he could visualize the image inside of that piece. Can you believe that? So he picked a certain marble that a lot of other people wouldn't use. But because of his vision, he could visualize what was inside that rock. He just had to get it out. So when God looks at you, he visualizes what's in you. But I'm going to I'm gonna have to break up some stuff here to get down in there to you. There's some good in there. I got to get in there. But he saw the image inside and in many respects, he, he set out to free the image that he saw inside of that marble. He was one of the greatest sculptors ever lived. But he chose mar marble and stone that other sculptors wouldn't do because they couldn't, didn't seem like nothing was in it. That's why when God looks at us, he sees there's an image in there. I'm trying to get to it, you nasty person. I'm trying to get in there and get the good out of you. There's some good down there. There's a, there's a vessel in there that I want to work with and make it like me. That's what he wants. So he starts chiseling away. I looked at that. He said, talked about Michelangelo had many apprentices that worked for him. In those days, you would have been sent to an established artist to learn the trade. So it says, they do some of the work of the carving under the tutelage of the master. You got to have somebody to tutor you. Because you think you know. You don't know. You need a tutor to tell you, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't cut that like that. You wouldn't do that. Wait a minute. See? He says, they would be under the tutelage of the master and they would then learn the techniques, I mean the techniques of sculpting. There's a technique in how to do this, how to get the best out of it. So then you gotta be skillful to know how to do it and you gotta be taught. So I was talking to Samson this afternoon. I said, uh, when Samson first came to this church, he, he wasn't saved. When he came in, he got saved after he got here when he talked to his family. And they said, uh, I mean, what's wrong with you? You was already saved. He said, no, I wasn't. Because when he got here and heard the word, he thought, I ain't saved. I need to get saved. So he called, he called back and said, Mama, I got saved. What do you mean you got saved? You was already saved. No, I wasn't. Because I had never been put into the hand of a sculptor. Because he sees something. I saw something in this brother. I thought, boy. Now, it's going to hurt the things he have to go through. But, hey, shout it out. Shout it out. He's going to fix you. He's going to make you what, what he wants you to be. And the, the people that won't yield to it are screwed up. They look like dummies sitting on the pew. I mean, they testify every now and then. They ain't got nothing to say. If you want to be used of God, he's going to have to chisel you out. Because the good part of you is down behind all them rocks and all the, all the heavy part. That's all of you. That's all of who you are. And God said, I got to get in there. Because I can't use you at the state you're in. I can't do it. I'm going to have to chisel it away. That chiseling is painful. But despise not the chastening of the Lord when he starts working on you, chastising you, breaking you down, showing you something. Don't get uptight about it, baby. Say thank you. Do it again, Lord. Listen. The apprentice is a person who is learning a trade from a skilled employer. By the time you get where I'm at, you're skilled. You see the devil? Did you know that's the devil? You think that's the devil? That ain't the devil. Oh, you're real dumb. Let me, let me show you. That's the devil. He comes so wrapped up. I was telling Samson, I said, see what the devil does. 
He comes with a package. Just think of this in the natural. He comes with a package, and it's silver, wrapped in silver paper. It may have a, a bow on it. It may not. And you, re and you refuse him and say, you're a liar. I'm not taking that. And you know what? He goes back. He rewraps the package. But the same thing is in that package. It just looks different. That's how we get deceived. So we say, well, mm -mm, I rebuked the devil. He was gone. He knew that wouldn't work with me. The devil says, I can't wait. I'm coming back. He always comes back. You got to be kidding yourself. If you told the devil he was alive and he went back to the pit, he coming back out. Because you know what he did? He watched you to see how you function under that pressure. And if you was like, mm, I can't even get my head up. It's not God, I'm just so sick. He said, hit them again in the same spot. See how they moan? See how they carry on over? They're just whining and whining about it. When you, can, when you can go in a fight with the devil, and in spite of what he, he does, I can come out okay. He don't know whether he hurt you or not. He told me, I, I told the Lord, no, please, don't put me through that again. You took the road, rebuke me, and reprove me. I said, Lord, please. The more pride you got, the more he's going to openly rebuke you. Pride is destructive. Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. He said, because of pride, you're going to destroy yourself. What did he say about Colorado Springs Fellowship? The church has, has two things wrong with it, pride and disobedience. Stupidity and pride, the devil only connect that because those two things don't go together. If, you, if you're stupid and proud, that's a tragedy. So he said, you got to humble yourself. Cry out and say, God, you know what? I'm just going to let you do for me what needs to be done. I'm not fighting nothing. You can't even begin to get better unless you go through the process that God's going to put us all through. That you can stand some, you can stand the storm. You okay. I can make it through. We had some people from New Life came to our church one time, and we were just teaching some, some basic fundamental things. Them jokers was choking and gagging like, like you, you thought you gave them a whole steak and said swallow it. I'm talking about baby stuff. Nothing, nothing big, baby stuff. They talk about, my God, it's so hard. Well, you out there listening to a bunch of lies out there, and you come into the truth. It's like, what is this? Truth. That's what you should have had. See? All other artists always rejected what didn't look good. But seeing that huge marble block, hidden potential, he chipped away everything that wasn't David, because he made he done the statue of David. Everything that wasn't David, he got rid of it. When he got through with it, we got a beautiful sculpture of King David. And you know what? He's naked. God said, I got to get them raggedy clothes, thinking things off of you. You wrapped up in a bunch of mess. All about you. I got to take all that off of you. And that's why people say, nah, I can't go to Sister Rose Church, honey. By the time she get through in the pulpit, you feel like you ain't got nothing. You ain't. That's why you feel like you ain't got nothing, because you don't. The word defines what we got. You don't define it. Hit the word up. It says whether I'm right or wrong. It says whether I'm obedient to God. It says whether I have a humble spirit or I'm, I'm full of pride. It tells you all of that. Change it. He said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. See? Under your, uh, uh, humble yourself, meaning you can do it, but man don't want to do it. So then God has to break your neck and put you under because you don't understand. The master works daily to transform this thing into something surpassingly beautiful. I say to people, they say, oh, you're such a beautiful person. That's from within. Beauty that God does in the heart radiates outside. But if you ain't got nothing done in here, you about an ugly jackrabbit. I mean, ain't nothing going on good about you, but you think it is. Then you come up in here and the word comes. And I'm just not going back. I felt like, my God, we all make mistakes. You know, Sister Rose, you know, what she did, she slammed people. I was laughing like, no, I didn't. I just told people the truth. Or do they get mad with me? I had some people mad at me. You don't tell me. I'll leave the church. Bye-bye. I'm not getting ready to say, oh, please don't leave. 
Go ahead. At least you left with truth. You left with truth. There is something unbelievably beautiful in all of us that God's trying to get to. He can't get to it until he, until he puts us through the refinery and refine us and put us through there. Because you know how you know you ain't been through there and, and processed? Because you still get nasty. You still rear up. You still got issues. You get mad about things. All the, when you know that you can just take it easy, you've been through the fire. Because you become pliable, not hard. Well, if I'm being reproved, should I not feel remorse? Should not tears come? If tears don't come, not true remorse. True remorse will produce tears. And God said, I'm going to break you until you cry, until you weep, until you say, I give up, I give up. God is steadily coming back to people, and I'm so tired of them because I happen to be one of the Apprentice. And he's going to go back and get this joke again. Here you go again. Pride, if you don't, if you don't humiliate pride, it'll never humble itself. You got to humiliate it. You're really stupid, aren't you? Me? I'm the smartest thing on the planet. I got an education. I got, I got a, a master's. You're stupid. Masters don't make us smart. You were dumb before you got it. You got to deal with who you are. Education does not perfect us. Are you kidding? Paul said when I found Christ, he said everything I thought I knew he was highly educated. He said I counted it as dumb that I might gain the excellency of Christ. So everything is don't matter. When he put my son, wrongfully put in prison for seven years, he broke him down. He thought he was going to get him a fast on the, fir- on the front of it. 30 days. The people in the prison said to him, what, what's wrong with you? You ain't eating. He thought God was just going to let him out of prison. God said, you ain't coming out. I'm putting you through this because this is what it's going to take to break you, and I got a plan for you, and I cannot uh, put that plan in place until you die. You got to die. That's why we look all over the place. You find people easily rubbed. You tell them the truth. They, they get an attitude. They don't want to be, you know, just bothering me about that. I'm human. Yeah. And that's what he's going to destroy. He came to destroy humanity of, of who we are. This fleshly stuff, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy it. And no matter whether you like it or not, you're going to get it. You know what? When I, when I don't have to tell you no more about where you at and what you're doing is wrong, you know you've been through the fire. Ain't a person in here there. I'd like to have one. Hey, me. Just one. None. Here I come back again. Jesus. Did someone say? Over and over again. I didn't ask for this job. Moses told God, said, these are your folks. I didn't ask for them. These people are crazy. They're rebellious. They're hard-headed. They're stubborn. They're set in their way. They want to do things their own way. I didn't ask you. These are your children. And then God, when, when, and when God got to him, he told Moses, them folks you brought out of Egypt. God said, I don't want to claim them either. It's the true people are people. You know what? If God had not taken uh, fight out of me, you know how many people in here I would beat up? <laughs> You'll be just beating people up and you wouldn't have nobody. You just think, hey, get out of here. But he, he puts patience in you. You love people. You treat them right. You try to help them as much as you can. Whew. That's what heaven is going to be beautiful. You don't have to deal with no church people. This is what I, here's, here's my word. Did I tell you that? I told you to watch the devil. I told you to pray. I told you the devil was coming. I told you if you didn't pray, what he was going to do. I told you that. Did you, do, did you forget that? I told you something, something, something. Are you back where you were before? Well, what are you doing? Over and over and over again. 
uh, when Bernard became the head deacon of the church, he come to me talking about, Mr. Rose, tell these people, I said, baby, hold up. You tell these people what to do, and they just keep doing the same thing. I said, really? Really? You just got them around here trying to run the church to keep it clean. And, and you got to tell them over and over again, what you doing? I said, Bernard, stay calm. Do not get an attitude. Because I can see Bernard now. So I said, and God's people, they're going to work your last nerve. Stay calm. Deal with it. Yo, sis, Roko, don't fuck them. I said, calm down. That's a part of the, that's part of the job. Putting up with rebellion, stupid, mentally insane, crazy. See? You know what a chisel is? It's a long bladed hand tool with a bevel cutting edge and a plain handle that is, that is struck with a hammer or a mallet used to cut or, uh, uh, or other hard materials. A chisel tool is forced into the material. So when you see the word of God, that's the chisel tool. <laughs> Keep hitting me. What is the problem? You? I'd rather be able to say, whoo, everybody in here is doing great. Look at our church. We just got beautiful people all over the building. They're just great. Nobody does anything. Nobody gets in no trouble or nothing. That ain't going to happen in this life. And I'm glad when we get to heaven, we don't have to deal with it. That is the most tiring part of ministry is constantly saying. I try to tell my, my say, I got a letter from him in the prison. When he went to the prison, he said, where you're at now is what I tried to save you from. Everything that's going on in your life, I'm trying to save you from having a hard time. Just follow instructions. It's not hard if you follow instructions. I'm like, but I'm grown. The only thing you tell me, I'm grown. Yeah? Listen to what it says about, about, the, uh, about the physician. Nieces have been getting ready to have to have this finger broke and reset. Because she caught something. She's always catching something. She got the finger, caught the little finger somewhere. And the thing, it, it, it must have broken because it's, it's bent up like that. And then it comes out like that. So Cliff said, oh, oh they're going to break that and reset it. Otherwise, you're going you to be walking around here with a nasty looking finger. A bent down when it should be in a certain way. It's, it's, it's all crazy. But if you catch your toe in the, in the, in the faucet in the bathroom, anything may happen. I said, tell me how you did that. How did you get out the tub and your t big toe got caught up in the faucet? I cannot explain that for nothing. She can't even explain. Talk, now she's back there now thinking there's mama telling my business. But, so I said, how did you get your toe in the faucet? Because if you get out of the, the, the stupid tub, how did you go back under there? She don't know. I don't know. Just like with that finger crooked up and messed up, she don't know something she did with it. She could tell you about that. But he said a physician who re-breaks an arm in order for it to heal properly harms his patient in order to heal him. A quote by C.S. Lewis says, in his book, he says, uh, a grief is observed. So you got to grieve to get through it. You're going to cry. Go ahead and cry. But don't cry a mad cry because that won't work. There's a cry of remorse and repentance, and there's a cry that get off of me. I'm tired of it. What else you want me to do? i done everything you said. No, you didn't. That's how I wouldn't be having this conversation. See? So he have to, he have to re-break it. I remember years ago when I was pregnant with Nisi. That's, she'll be 68 here in a few weeks. No, 58, I'm sorry. <laughs> 58. And I got out the car, I was pregnant with her, and my nephew was in the car. And when I got ready to get out, I had my hand there, and he slammed the door, and the door locked on that finger. And I was in so much pain. And he said, to John, keep your head out the door. And I came over to him, I said, I beat your brains out. I was in so much pain, I, couldn't even, I didn't have no strength. I said, I beat your brains out. 
Because my finger's killing me in the door, and he's telling me, you should keep your hand out the door. When I went to the doctor, they had to go up under my fingernail, all the way down here. The, 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 the bruised blood was, that nail was black. He said, this is going to hurt. He put a little, what they call freeze stuff on there, but that, did, that didn't do it. And stuck that thing all the way under that nail. I thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown. And even after he got the blood out, I had to sleep with my arm up like this because my, that, my arm hurt me, that thing hurt me all this side of my body. To this day, I have a problem with that nail. And that's 58 years ago. The thing that God is trying to straighten out in you, it won't leave you wounded. It'll leave you healed. It'll leave you better. And you won't be half functioning. You'll function properly. But you got to be willing to go through it. Take the pain. Take the pain. You're going to feel better afterward. You say, I would like to be like Sister Rose. No, you don't. You can't even comprehend the cup I had to drink and still drink. You can't comprehend it. You don't want to be like me. You want to be like him. Because you ain't getting ready to go through what I went through. Because, see, your cross ain't, may not be as heavy as mine. You ain't doing that. I just told Lord, I sure would like to be like Sister Rose till you find out what, what it took to bring Sister Rose where she is today. See? Michelangelo used his chisel to form David from a marble block. It says, so God was suffering, uh, put us through suffering so he can form us into the image of Christ. Because Christ is... He's in that, I'm going to curve it out so you can just see him. And you can just see him. I had the dream uh, after I got saved that I reached a point in my life that um, all you could see was him. You couldn't see me anymore. And the last thing to die out, you know what that was? My gut. It faded out slow. <laughs> Everything else just like Jesus except the belly. You know what that was? Food. But then, all these years later, he come and says, let me have that. And I said, thank you. I am happy about that. So now, I don't have to worry about that no more. Never could conquer it on my own. There's a place you go through to conquer that. And he puts you through it. When you go through it, it's not even a fight. It's not, I'm not going through a whole bunch of stuff. Hey, I'm having a good time. I'm loving this. That's what folks say. You, he said, what? I said, Lord have mercy. By the time I explained it to a few people in the church, we had preachers say, I don't, I don't know about that thing. My son-in-law back there said, I explained it to Cliff. He said, oh, no, I don't want that. And the Lord got him for it, and I'm glad he did. He said, why don't you want it? I want to be able to eat any time I get ready. If I want to eat a pint of ice cream before I go to sleep, I want to be able to do it. Just want to be out of control. That's man. That's who he is. I want freedom to be a fool. Don't tell me I can't be a fool. I want freedom to act up. I want freedom to let everybody know who I am, where I'm going. This is what's going on. I tried to talk to my son Lamont, tried to talk to him, talk to him. Beat his tail, everything. So I said, I got the chisel. I'm going to chisel you right behind that, them, them bars, and I'm going to teach you something, and I'm going to give you seven years to learn it. You don't have to take that long to learn it. It all depends on what God's doing for you and how he's going to strip you of everything. See? So don't, don't begrudge trials or persecution. Because that's, that's a making. That's what's going to make you. So when you upset that people lied on you and talked about you, don't worry about it. He says, rejoice, be exceedingly glad. Think it not strange that you don't run to the same excessive rioting that they are. They think you're strange because you ain't out there partying and doing everything they do. They think you're strange. See? God's going to put you through it. I don't want to do that no more. I don't have to fight it. I don't want to do it. I'm not interested. Every time I say to my kids, food is irrelevant. <laughs> she said, go in the room and laugh. She said, food is irrelevant. It's not funny. But they, they laugh. 
about it. It's like she's off on the deep end somewhere. Because uh, the first time I came to the church, I said, the Lord showed me that food was irrelevant. Here go people all over the church like, but where does she plan to take us now? Is it irrelevant? I can't believe she said that. They didn't say this, but they looked on their face was like, what? I want to see where this is going. I had to learn it was irrelevant. Otherwise, I was a slave to it. It's not important. Then I said, Mama, you going to eat that? I don't know yet. Well, honey, you better think. I don't care. It's like, think about it. What you going to eat? And I don't think I'm eating today. Okay. They just really, they got, they, they got more issues than I got. I don't have it. They're worried about it. And then Mom come in and say, are you getting enough? Sis, yes. I'm getting a plenty. All the stuff that you think that's going to have to fill up your stomach, that ain't necessary. That's because you're a slave to it. Once he takes you out of it, you look back and say, well, where was I at? Where was I at? So God is trying to create a masterpiece with all of us, as Michelangelo did to that statue. I'm turning you into a masterpiece. It's going to make the difference in your life. You're going to have an effect on people. That's why you can't affect nobody. That's why you make contacts and it means nothing. When he changes you, it's going to make a difference. Because people see Jesus and not you. And that's what he's trying to do. This is the masterpiece is him. I'm going to put me, I'm going to make you like me. We don't want to be like him. We don't want that. Okay? So God is reaching out, getting the, the things that nobody else wants. Because nobody wanted me. He wanted me. See? You can never grow closer to God without going through the fire. So I just told the Lord, make, bring me closer. You want to come closer? Yeah. I'm going to have to break your legs so you can't run. Because <laughs> if I don't break your leg, you're going to get up and leave. You're, you'll never get there. He's trying to get you there. It's okay. When you reach a point in your life, you say, yes, Lord. Everything he says, yes, Lord. What do you want me to do? Yes, Lord. I need you to shut up. Yes, Lord. I need you to fast more. Yes, Lord. Yeah, how, how many days? Man, how many, how many days is that? Because I thought if things don't pick up the way I think they should pick up, I'm adding to the fast. And they'll be looking at me just like this. What's our problem? When I called the fast at Thanksgiving after Charles died, the whole church was against me. <laughs> the whole church. I said, we're going to go on a fast. It's Thanksgiving. Yes. And what's that? Well, you can make a Thanksgiving dinner any time of the year. It don't have to be on a certain day. I never called another one. <laughs> they was in the game. She, and, then, and then Regina said, wish Mr. C was here. Mr. C wouldn't let her do it. Because I can see my husband right now. You done lost your mind. Thanksgiving. Well, we got 365, 364 days in the year. You don't need to take Thanksgiving. He would, he would explain that to the letter. Looking crazy. In Germany, we always fasted because uh, we had Saturday night service, so we always fasted after Saturday night service. And he had just got saved. So every Saturday, he couldn't eat. He said, who started this mess? <laughs> I, said, I said, what do you mean start this mess? This is not mess. This is fasting. He said, every Saturday? Yeah, and shut up. You come in at the last hour. Take it and run with it. Your mama's forever coming up with some crazy stuff. It's not crazy. I want to get closer to God. What are you going to do? You're going to go through pain and suffering. That'll make you come closer to God. Make clear that suffering is a grace from God. We get that grace now to prepare us for living forever. You, you, gotta, you can't go and live eternally in heaven without being made down here. Because the way you are right now, you ain't going up there. So, listen to this. I found this as I was studying. And it talked about the mountain climber. And this is what it says. Mountain climbers could save time and energy if they reached the summit in a helicopter. 
but their purpose is not that. It's conquest and efficiency. How efficient am I in climbing this mountain? Now, he could get to the top. If he just get a helicopter, that's what y'all want. God, I can get to this right here. I mean, why take me all the way around this way over here? You know, Israel could have got where they needed to go in a matter of days. It took them 40 years to get there because of who they were. 40 years. Are you going to let it take 40 years for you? Some of y'all ain't going to live 40 more years. Then what? You better make, you better make everything count. I ain't going to be here no 40 years. Some of y'all... Y'all doomed. We dead way before then. So I'm going to try to fight and stay as long as I can. It don't matter. Once upon a man to die after that to the judgment. See? Suffering. You're going to have to climb some mountain and you, God ain't going to let you get a helicopter. He said, I'm up here. I made it. The climbers are still working, trying to get up there. Still pushing hard, trying to get up there going through what they have to go through to get up there. And you sitting there, tell them, I'm up here, praise God, you getting ready to break your neck. Because the process God takes us through trains us as we go. We learn as we go. If we can do everything in a moment, in a helicopter, hey, I'm going to heaven, I'm just going to get in a helicopter and going up there, you ain't going to get in. You're not going to get in. See? Paul said, if I must needs glory, I'm going to glory in my infirmity. Why? How, how is it that he's in a place that he's going to glory in his pain? Yeah. I said, God, please. I've had some pain. Still have some. And until he comes and moves it, you're going to see how long you, how many times you're going to say, I just wish you'd come on. I've been praying for you. God, what is it? What's the problem? I know you can do it. He, your temper tantrum is not going to move God. Like that man that told me was in the church, Griffin said, he was tired of waiting on the Lord to give him a wife. If God didn't hurry up and give him a wife, he going to sleep on the floor. I said, God don't care. Get on the floor. God ain't on the floor. Go on down there. You don't want to land on a hard floor. You can't make God move because you have a tantrum. I told him I'm going to do such and such a thing. Go ahead. At the end of the day, <laughs> You're going to have to do it his way. That's the only way to get through. See? Paul said, for our light affliction is but for a moment. But it's achieving in us an eternal glory that for our ways, everything that we go through. That's how you can go through it. It's for the moment. It's for the moment. Suffering can help you mature, help you to grow. That's why you look like a dwarf 10 years later, 20 years later, you still look. You can't grow until you go through something. You go through it, you start growing. Start getting better. God done bless you so much, and the devil make you tear up your own life, and you're around here blaming your mama and everybody else. See? God refines us in our suffering and puts you through it, and then when you get through it, then you look back and you understand why I had to go through that. I had to go through it. I had to learn. I, had, I realized that I had to be strong as a leader. The Lord told me that many years ago when he first called me, he said, leaders must be strong, grow. Well, people who whoop somebody else can't whoop a leader. What gets another person down can't get you down. You've got to stand tall. In the midst of adversity, in the midst of your worst pain and suffering, stand tall. No matter what it is, don't be one of them people say, well, Sister Rose, she didn't even handle that good. She fell apart. You're not going to say that about me. I refuse to give that to you. I refuse. <laughs> I'm getting ready to close. Um, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So what we have is a treasure, but he's got to get to it, that his excellency may show through us. We are troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. We are perplexed. We don't understand it, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. 
always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus by, might be made manifest in our body. That's the only way it can be manifest is that you go through this. For we which live are always delivered unto death. For Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. You cannot get from a preacher what you need to get from until they experience death of themselves. Then what they give to you, it brings life to you. You say, I feel so much better. I got to die first before you'll feel better. I got to put up with you and all your crap before, I, before, you, before, 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 you, before you feel better. But hey, by the grace of God, we get there. So the next time you're facing something, you're already facing something before you go out tonight. Of course, you're going to feel better because you're getting ready to eat. But the bottom cut says, yeah, things is really tough, child. We're going to go and buy the chicken place so we can get us some chicken. And laugh and talk. You get a bunch of black people around the table. Uh, 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 ain't, ain't Lucy died. As soon as they bury Ain't Lucy, everybody fall back on the food. Hey, you don't even know Ain't Lucy died. <laughs> you know, girl, do, woo. Yeah, they're having a good time. Everybody's laughing and giggling. Jess was crying at the funeral. Now they're eating happy. See? Paul said, I was in stripes, imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, watchings, in fastings, pureness by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the arm of righteousness on the right hand on the, and on the left. By honor and dishonor, by an evil report and a good report. So they talk about make a bad report about you. Oh, so what? As deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. So it makes you alive. The chastisement won't kill you. You only think. He says, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. All this comes through suffering. Quit complaining about it. If you ain't got a trial, you'll never get to heaven without it. Because it is the making for you and destroying who you are and making you into the vessel of honor. You can be either a vessel of honor or one of dishonor. It's your choice. In a house, there are many vessels. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Do, do, do you want to be the person that people look at you and say, Oh, I hope I don't be the fool she was. I hope I don't do what she did. You don't have to. I don't want to be the vessel that people hope they don't never turn out like I turned out. Be sweet. I know that you made it when I come to you and rebuke you and you say, thank you so much, Sister Ball. Praise God. I know you made it. But here's what they do. I say, I got to talk to you about something. I'm already ready for you. I'm not just, I'm not, I'm not just going to say okay. I'm not going to say, oh, well, that's it. No. i got to show you some justification. If I stole that cookie, at least I can make you know I was hungry and I didn't have nothing else to eat. You're still a thief. That ain't going to change it. In the course of a week, you wouldn't believe how many people I've talked to on the phone to say, you better pull it in. You better pray. You don't have it together. You're messed up. You better stop that. The other morning I got up before I can even get to my prayer and devotion. I was on the phone where I bet you five or six calls back to back. What did I tell you? Yes, ma'am. What are you doing? Yes, ma'am. You don't get it right? Yes, ma'am. You're lying again. Yeah. So, so when are you going to fix it? I'm working on it. I told the Lord. I told the Lord. I know one day, God ain't going to wait one day for you. He's doing things right now. One day you may not be here. There is peace at the foot of the cross. There is peace at the foot of the cross. Oh, you just lay down your burdens, lay down your ways, lay down everything at the foot of the cross. Yeah. 
there is joy at the foot of the cross. Oh, yes, there is. There is joy at the foot.